Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank the uh, organizers first for in, or, for organizing this very interesting conference, which focuses on economics, which is great. We, are, we end up always in these interdisciplinary environments, and it's good to be among economists. Um, I'm going to talk about sources of inequality at birth, the interplay between genes and parental socioeconomic status. And uh, about your note on, uh, on picking up that jacket, <coughs> my jacket, I dug out of the closet for this cold weather to find out here that the zipper is broken, so it's pretty cold. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, this is joint work with Pietro Biroli, with Hans von Kippersluis, Kevin Tom, Pia Arce, Jeremy Follen, and Andres Marais. Pia and Jeremy are uh, elsewhere now. They, uh, they did all the hard work uh, as, as research assistants. Andries Marais is a postdoc at uh, FU Amsterdam, where I have a, a grant in, uh, from, the, from the Dutch uh, National Science Foundation, and he's paid from that. Uh, Pietro is now at the uh, University of Bologna. I am at the Center for Economic and Social Research at uh, U USC, but also Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. And, um, well, let's leave it at that. So the motivation... <coughs> Uh, okay, first maybe the economics. Uh, the, the economics here is the economics of uh, of human capital formation in health and uh, and education, etc. Lots of traits that we're exploring. And so there's there's basically this fundamental notion that uh, human life starts with two uh, lotteries. Uh, the first one being your uh, genes, um, which you're endowed with at conception, and the second one being your family environment. And then the, the family socio-economic environment is. is is thought of as being very important. So that's the idea. And, and, and uh, these lotteries basically set in motion a uh, trajectory from birth onwards uh, in health, behavior, living environments, and socioeconomic success. And so these are two very important uh, influences on these trajectories. So that's kind of the, the basic uh, first notion. Um, and, and it relates to e equality of opportunity, et cetera, because uh, your genes and your family, there's nothing about that that you deserve. You didn't get them from through hard work or through good behavior. Um, and then uh, there's also evidence of strong intergeneral uh, transmission of advantage. Uh, so the idea is, is this transmission of genetic advances to what extent? or uh, social advances, socioeconomic status. And so that's kind of tells you about G and about uh, socioeconomic status. And then there is also this notion that there might be gene by socioeconomic status, family socioeconomic status, basically parental socioeconomic status interactions. And there's the Skyro hypothesis, uh, the idea that the, the moderating, that there is a moderating effect of low socioeconomic status on the heritability of children's IQ. Um, and also, we're exploring this basically more generally, also for other, other traits. So, uh, SCAR uh, introduced this notion, this concept uh, of, of the scar Rho hypothesis. Rho uh, found evidence for, from, for it, but Tucker, Drop, and Bates uh, find more limited evidence that the, that the, that the scar Rho effect is kind of small in the United States and was absent in uh, Europe and uh, took a drop and base, based this on uh, fem, uh, twin studies, uh, basically a, a meta-analysis of, of, of lots of um, twin studies. <clears throat> so the question we're asking is, are there important interactions between genotype and childhood socioeconomic status, which is basically parental socioeconomic status in later life outcomes, so much later in life. In fact, we're using the HRS and the, and the ELSA and the WLS, so we're looking at people uh, ages 50 and above. Um, so again, consider these two birth endowments. We, we use uh, genotypes, basically pro, pro, uh, polygenic scores, 45 different uh, polygenic scores, and we do use a consistent measure across these three data sets of family socioeconomic status, and I'll explain that in more detail, but basically it's parental educational attainment and a measure of uh, occupational class. Then we evaluate the interplay between genes and parental socioeconomic status in later life human capital. We look at main effects, G and E, and also G by E. Um, if there is G by E, or if it's absent, then, you, you, then we can think about whether uh, basically, we can think of the, uh, the result being that uh, there, there are basically independent effects. So basically, are the effects on lifetime success of genes and environments independent from one another? Or is there more complex interplay? Does the genetic potential depend on one's early family life uh, environment? 
Um, so genes can't and maybe should not be changed, <clears throat> but environments could reduce uh, genetic disadvantage. So this is a bit of the motivation for this kind of work. Genetic data can help identify people who are genetically disadvantaged and vu or vulnerable, and G by E can then inform policymakers uh, about the uh, extent by which environments might cushion cushion, cushion against uh, the, this vulnerability. Um, Environments can also be targeted by policy interventions, and uh, I think it's important. This is something that Kevin, Tom, and, exam uh, and, and I were, were coming up uh, as an example to motivate early, uh, this is that six years ago, to NIH, why this might be relevant. People are, are concerned about uh, genetics, uh, of course, uh, understanding the genetics of individuals, but really you don't need policymakers to know about the genetic makeups of individuals for this to be, to be able to do this, because you can observe in, let's say, the HRS in your data set, types of behaviors and type uh, that, that are associated with the genetic makeup uh, of individuals. So then you can still identify potential policy interventions. And we have this nice little example, which is in the footnote. <clears throat> in, in the US, basically, we find that people are still smoking um, and despite uh, all that is thrown at them, right? We, we, we text them, we have information campaigns, and we also don't allow them anymore to smoke in public places. So if those individuals that are still smoking are really kind of uh, uh, genetically predispositions to smoking, so maybe, maybe they're really addicted, uh, then you might be limited to pharmacotherapy or pharmacogenetics. So there's a clear implication of that. But if these people are are genetically at risk, but also have specific environments, say uh, adverse uh, childhood environments, then you may target uh, those environments. So genetics can inform you about the types of policy interventions. <coughs> um, and genetic information can also be used preventively by individuals to avoid harmful environments. Uh, in here, in this last uh, bullet, basically, it's more about uh, medical doctors, uh, sort of a trusted person that you trust with your genetic data, and uh, then uh, you can base uh, on your personal genetic data with this kind of trusted advice, so you can think potentially about uh, preventing uh, certain environments. <clears throat> So genotype and early life and envi family environments have very large influences on later life outcomes. Uh, basically, twin studies suggest that some 30 to 70 percent of the variation in traits across individuals can be attributed to genetics. I don't have to explain that to you. Basically, everything is heritable, so genes matter, and family socioeconomic status also matters. There's the early uh, childhood liter literature by Heckman et al., the first thousand days of life matter very much, and it's in the family there that very matters very much, much. And then we have the, the, the early origins of, of uh, the early life, uh, the fetal origins of, of, um, of future disease, the Barker's hypothesis. And this is not only uh, relevant for health, but it's also shown that it has uh, effects on human capital. So basically, the, 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 the uh, pregnancy, a good, a good, healthy environment is important, and also the first uh, thousand days, roughly, of, of life, or five years uh, of life. Um, adult <coughs> illnesses are also more prevalent and, and, and problematic among those that have experienced uh, childhood, uh, or adverse uh, childhood circumstances. And then there is, exists this link between parental socioeconomic status and child health, and also then between child health and, and future educational and labor market outcomes. So basically, uh, good reasons to believe that the early life family environment is, is, uh, is very important and it has effects on uh, or, or influences on, on health later in life and also uh, socioeconomic outcomes. Then there's also <coughs> evidence that suggests that there might be a role for gene by early life uh, socioeconomic status uh, interactions in later life outcome. Um, the influence of genetic factors is believed to depend on environmental exposures or gene by environment interplay. Also, theories suggest that disparities in health and human capital emerge basically by this kind of cumulative uh, um, disadvantage and, and there are interactions with genes. So the idea is that the that, that early life is very important, that the facts grow 
uh, over time uh, and become uh, more important. So basically, for this reason, we are looking at later life outcomes and this very early life uh, environment of childhood. So G by E may be stronger basically later in life and stronger for early versus late life environments. That's the idea. And so that the motivation for what we're doing and what, uh, what's basically the case or what is a con our contribution is, is that so far there have not been any sort of systematic analysis in the following way. What we're doing is that we're using many traits. We're looking at 45 phenotypes. <clears throat> we do this across three data sets for power, but also robustness. We focus on the on, on well-powered genome-wide association studies, and then we'll use a pre precise and, and consistently measured family socioeconomic status factor uh, that's basically available in these three data sets. So then focus a bit more on uh, the analysis now. Uh, so we do a kind of standard thing. We have uh, the outcome, YIT for 45 different phenotypes that relate to human capital, health and human capital, uh, a linear or less uh, specification. We have a polygenic score for the individual, so we have 45 of them that we're trying out. Uh, we have two types of polygenic scores that we're using. The top hits, basically the uh, polygenic score that's uh, constructed on the basis of the genome-wide significant hits, and one that, uh, that is basically uses all the SNPs then we have our measure of family socioeconomic status during childhood, EIT, and uh, an interaction term. And then we have a factor of individual controls, which is kind of the standard, um, standard uh, procedures. Uh, we include uh, the first 10 principal components of the genetic data, uh, dummies for age in years. Uh, we have age in years squared. We have region of birth and interaction between age in years and, in, and, and sex, and then interactions of all the baseline controls with the polygenic scores and, and, and our family SES uh, measure. So then we use the health and retirement study, the Wisconsin longitudinal study, and the English longitudinal uh, study of aging. These are longitudinal studies, everybody knows them probably. They have rich phenotypic and genotypic information, and they have this parental socioeconomic status measure, which I'll discuss in a bit. They have similar age ranges, so we focus on older age individuals and their data sets from the UK and US. So the picture again is we're looking at much later in life uh, outcomes. We're looking at the genetics and family socioeconomic status. So this is the most boring part. Uh, we're starting uh, basically with gen genome-wide associations. This is our starting point. We start with the GWAS catalog, 776 GWASs. And the GWAS atlas, where we use the Watanabe et al. Uh, um, uh, GWASs uh, after filtering. So they did some sort of first step in how they selected uh, GWASs. And this is the, these are the criteria, basically sufficiently large uh, genotyping uh, chips with a SNP count that is larger than 450,000, a SNP-based heritability C-score of the GWAS that is greater than two, and then uh, European P and ancestry sample sizes uh, greater than 50,000, and for both cases and controls, they used uh, greater than 10,000 for binary traits. So that's our first uh, step. And then we apply additional exclusion criteria, a genome-wide significant SNP count of at least six, whether a more relevant similar phenotype exists, whether the phenotype has a low prevalence, uh, whether a bigger or more powerful GWAS is available. We have to focus on uh, European samples, so we take the non-European uh, GWAS out. And uh, the trait then last has to be available in all the three uh, data sets. And then that, and, and in this way, we end up with 45 traits and associated GWAS. So these are the traits then. We have basically anthropometric traits, BMI, severe obesity, height, health rating, we have health traits, a bunch of health traits, health rating, combined parental age, cholesterol, asthma, well, you get the point. Um, <clears throat> then we have a bunch of health behaviors. Uh, actually, this is more fertility, so we have a mixture of fertility in your standard health behaviors like physical activity, drinks per week, smoking, cessation, etc. Then we have a bunch of subjective well-being measures and kind of uh, dep dep depressive symptoms. Um, and then we have what we call personal traits. These are socioeconomic traits like education, cognition, household income. And then we have something like risk-taking behavior and neuroticism. So um, 
Okay, so then what we do is we we'll harmonize the summary statistics. Basically, we uh, ensure that the data can be analyzed uh, together, and we meta-analyze the uh, this data with 23andMe when we have it available. And this is only for a couple of cases, like educational attainment. And then we use the GUS summary statistics, of course, that leave out HRS, WS, or ELSA for reasons of statistical independence. Then we generate our two PGSs. Uh, one with all SNPs and one with only the genome-wide significant SNPs. Um, then we construct a measure of socioeconomic status. We measure basically uh, the socioeconomic status of individuals in their childhood through an estimate of what the parental socioeconomic status is. And uh, we basically use a structural equation model to, to combine the, the measures and we then standardize it uh, with a mean zero and standard, and, and standard deviation one. And the measures that we use are, are simple. It's mother's years of education, father's years of education, and then we use father's occupation. And here we had to do some work to make sure that, the diff that the, we get kind of the classes uh, of father's occupation uh, that are available in the three data set. There's, there's some sort of small differences between the uh, job categories. In the end, we end up with basically five categories that we can rank on the basis of uh, levels of, uh, of education and levels of income. And so we have five categorical uh, uh, variables here. <clears throat> then last, we do a meta-analysis anal analysis as well. So the same uh, regression, basically linear regression. Uh, we pull the three data sets at the individual level. We standardize the measures to make the phenotypes more comparable across the data sets. And uh, we use the kind of s uh, same uh, linear model. Okay, so I'm going to show the results, main results for 45 phenotypes first. And since that's a lot to digest, I'll also focus on uh, nine specific examples. <clears throat> so this is the club. This is a lot of clutter, but uh, let me see if I can explain it. So ELSA here, WLS here. HRS here, and this is the mega-analysis. We'll focus on the mega-analysis, simpler to digest one of them. Um, and we see all the 45 phenotypes. They are organized, in this case, by the size of the, co the red coefficients, which is the coefficient on, on socioeconomic status, on family, on parental socioeconomic status. So basically, from uh, large negative for depressive symptoms, anxiety, and treatment medications taken, and all the way to kind of in the middle where we have Alzheimer's, prostate cancer, where there's a, a small, a basically ne negligible coefficient for family socioeconomic status, and all the way down to very strong positive coefficients for things like education, household income, and cognition. <clears throat> so we see that the polygenic scores all kind of generally have power, but they, there are some differences. Um, and and uh, what else did I want to say here? Uh, I want to say that the coefficient, the, the standard errors here are 95% confidence intervals. And then with the striking part here is that when you look at the yellow dots, which is the interaction between the polygenic score and family SES, uh, they're all hovering around uh, zero. So they seem to be small. <coughs> Here we do the same thing for the top hits, the polygenic scores that contain basically the genome-wide significant hits, and the pattern is very similar. Um, but of course, the polygenic scores themselves in blue have kind of uh, smaller, uh, less power, basically. So let's focus then on nine examples. We we'll focus basically on first the, those top three that have the strongest negative correlation with socioeconomic status. Then we focus on the on, on three in the middle, and then uh, three that have uh, a strong positive uh, gene, uh, to, sorry, uh, correlation with, the, with family socioeconomic status. So again, let's focus on the mega-analysis. So we see uh, basically uh, these negative coefficients. You can see clear, more clearly now that, these, that the G by uh, family SCS are, are kind of zero all along the, the, the different types of, uh, of Phenotypes that we're focusing on, we see that the polygenic scores have power, uh, even in the case of cancer where it's small, but remember this is basically a uh, 95 confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. Um, yeah, and, and otherwise I kind of 
<clears throat> I think we discussed most of this. And then here we focus on a kind of narrower scale here, again, on the coefficients for the G, G the interaction term, and we see that it's very small. In some cases, you see something that is, I don't want to call it statistically significant, but um, you, you can see that you can have 5% uh, uh, confidence when you, this is not, not uh, corrected from multiple hypotheses, but it points to the, the situation that if you had taken this one, you might have uh, had a publication uh, <coughs> finding your G by SES interaction. When you do all of them, it's clear that that's not the case. Here is a different way of, uh, of showing this. This is the distribution of the coefficients among all 45 phenotypes and the three data sets for the meta-analysis for the polygenic score in blue. So we see the polygenic scores tend to have power. Uh, in this area, they have a little bit less power. Um, this uh, kind of functional of fitting of a polynomial also produces some weird things that we have negative polygenic scores, which I don't think we really have in the data because it smooths it a bit. But basically the point is we have power for the polygenic score and we see that the interaction term here is very small, ranging between uh, minus 0 0.025 to plus 0 0.025. And so uh, <coughs> very little evidence basically of G by family S inter interplay. Here we see, again, the mega, mega analysis, and the point is to make here is basically that we see the same pattern in each of the individual data sets, but a bit noisier, the HRS, WS, and ELSA. Um, yeah, this we can probably kind of skip, but we see basically for the top SNPs, similar patterns. And again, we see that the uh, G by family SCS interactions are very uh, small and that we generally also still have power in the polygenic score, although now the polygenic scores are weaker because we only focus on the top hits. So that's not always the case that we have power. <coughs> Same thing basically in the, for the top SNP, scores, we also find no interaction. And this repeats the same graph, but now for, again, the, the genome-wide significant polygenic score. And here it's present in all the three data sets. How am I doing for time? I might be a bit fast, actually. Yeah, we have 45 minutes. Sorry? You still have, uh, I don't think, uh, 15 minutes. Okay. So then we did some, um, I want to say that this work is still preliminary. So these are kind of first robustness uh, checks. So what we did here is organize, we focus on the mega analysis, again, the, the polygenic score with all the SNPs, PGS1. And we show here now uh, the data organized by the size of the polygenic score, the, the coefficient of the polygenic score. So the point to make here is that, okay, here you might expect to find nothing because your polygenic score doesn't have much power. But if you go down, you don't see that there's any systematic changes. We're still all hovering around uh, zero, these, the, the G by S SES interactions. <clears throat> here uh, we're looking at the coefficients, but we drop all the small uh, betas for the polygenic score, so we drop all of those uh, below 0 0.05. So I'm showing basically the same kind of diagram, but now uh, but now now binned, um, and we see again uh, G by SES around uh, zero, and here there's this cutoff. Uh, because of the cutoff that we're only focusing on the well on the large uh, the PGSs with large uh, coefficients. <coughs> Here we do one more thing to that. We still focus on the polygenic scores with coefficients that are greater than 0 0.05. But now we flip the socioeconomic status sign. The no, the idea here is basically that if all these interactions are in the same direction, 
uh, then we should flip those traits that have a negative uh, that, are, that are negative. So Alzheimer's, we basically switch to having to not having Alzheimer's. And when you do that, um, nothing very much happens. If you you can kind of see that it shifts a little bit. So basically, we're here in the where we didn't uh, change signs, and we have a slightly negative uh, average. And here, it moves up a little bit to being slightly positive. I don't think there's anything significant here. And again, we don't find any much evidence for G by uh, family SCS interactions. So then a brief discussion. So what we did we do, we perform, a, perform basically a systematic analysis with many traits, 45 traits. We use three data sets. We focus on well-powered uh, GWASs. We have a precise and consistently measured family SES factor, factor, basically educational attainment of parents and, 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 and a kind of a, a job, socioeconomic status factor, job category. And uh, we had this hypothesis that uh, the, basically the notion of cumulative disadvantage and the, and the very strong role that we know as economists of early life circumstances, we proxy this basically by parental socioeconomic status which is known to be very important, the family uh, environment that you grow up in and, and their socioeconomic status. And all of this suggests that we uh, should find kind of large effects. And uh, uh, we hypothesize, that that, uh, hypothesize basically that that would give us the power to uncover G by family SES interactions. And the result was, of course, that we found no strong evidence of a linear gene environment interaction between the polygenic score and parental socioeconomic status. So what does this mean? Well, the, simp the main conclusion is that the predictive power of polygenic scores in our analysis does not appear to systematically differ between individuals born into high and low socioeconomic status families. And so the scar row hypothesis is kind of not confirmed. And I mean with this in a more general way, scar row focuses on IQ, but in a more general way, it's also not uh, across all of these other phenotypes that we're using. So going beyond IQ and, and, and educational attainment. And this is of interest to the broader literature in social science uh, genetics, uh, where these kind of analysis are being done. This is kind of uh, a way of testing scar, scar row. <coughs> So yeah, the interpretation then would be that genes, nature, and parental socioeconomic status independently contribute to human capital formation. Um, or it could be that human capital is a more complex function of both nature and nurture that is simply not captured in our, our linear model. Basically, we have an incorrect specification. It may also be that GWAS, actually, and I think this is probably true, is not sensitive to G by E. And so possibilities are um, what is called gene by environment uh, GWASs or something like uh, the variance uh, GWAS um, that focuses on, on, on how much, not just only the mean effect, but also how much variance there is in the 10 minutes. Ten minutes. We, we can open the questions as well. Yeah. Um, so this, this is also maybe a potential uh, way of getting at, at, at uh, G by environment. So basically, I'm trying to, sorry. The variance G by basically focuses on, on how much uh, variation there is in, uh, in, in, in um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It basically, variance is important because uh, if there is an influence of, of the environment, then you expect more variation. And so uh, I would, uh, that might be a useful GWAS, type of GWAS to then uncover gene by socioeconomic status uh, and, and, uh, or any environment, basically. Uh, the other thing is that socioeconomic status here might not be well measured. <clears throat> Maybe we need to focus on, on more significant deprivation, so the bottom of the family socioeconomic status distribution, or maybe you need to you need to focus on things that maybe really matter, actually, and it's not just socioeconomic status, but things that are associated with it, like financial distress. In a, in a separate paper with, with Kevin Tom, we focused on uh, gene, by, gene by family SES, uh, a similar kind of analysis on smoking, and we found some uh, G by E. 
Um, but there we have measures that really focused on uh, self-reported measures on, on kind of uh, disadvantage in early life, whether your family was poor, your father was unemployed and stuff like that. Uh, so maybe that was a, a true one. It might also be that that paper <laughs> was actually one of those lucky ones. Um, the next steps that we're doing is uh, GIV. So uh, basically genetic, in, in genetic uh, instrumental variables methods. We conduct G GWAS uh, on basically two halves of the UKB sample. And then you can construct a polygenic score for half the sample and another one for uh, on one GWAS and uh, the other half, uh, you can also do that and then you can instrument the two polygenic scores and this reduces bias in the main effect. So far, uh, we haven't fully looked at this data yet, but the results don't seem to be that promising of what I recall. But uh, I, I, we basically have to look more into this. Um, but there's of course one, uh, you, 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 reduce, uh, you reduce bias, you reduce measurement error, so you get um, uh, more power. But at the same time, we're now looking at GWASs that are based on the UKB, so we have smaller uh, GWASs. Yeah, and, and the last thing is that we can maybe explore uh, variance GWASs or do something else. Um, that's it. Thank you. So maybe we should open to questions now. Yeah. Of the three things that you list under human capital being a more complex function, and that's why it doesn't show up the interaction, uh, two of them are hard to fix. One is easier. The SES measurement for the WLS and the HRS. Yeah. Both of them are linked to the 1940 manuscript census, which has individual level income and educational attainment information. And you might get better mileage out yeah. of that than out of the simple categorical measure yeah. you have, because there's a lot of variation in economic status within all of those educational categories, especially within categories like farmer. Yeah. There's also measures of home ownership. Um, in 1940, that might yeah. get you some more information about the, the actual standing of the family and yeah. unemployment in the census year. The information that you have in the HRS and WLS now that I imagine you're using is retrospectively reported by a study participant. Yeah. And that's often problematic. Is that true, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very good point. And one one unfortunate thing is there is some reduction in the sample size and the matching that, that takes place. But yeah, we we'll for sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Precise. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of building on that, even if you were able to show for a subsample of the data where you had really good uh, SES measure, where you could make the case the SES is much better measured, and then looked at the gene by. SES interactions and didn't really see any movement, even even if you didn't really have a ton of power. But even if you know that would be a little bit that would help convince convince us that that you know held up to more robust measure. What kind of data set would it be? I think actually uh, we could focus just on the HRS because it seems to be that the it showed it seemed the data looked better for the HRS than the other two. Yeah. yeah, and you know, building in 1940 census, or even yeah, you know, once it's to the 1940 census, you can link it to administrative records, which might allow you to get, you know, yeah, tax data maybe into the 1970s or some of these families. Yeah. 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 This is this is really interesting. Um, I, I'm wondering, could you look at the SNP level results, um, interact with the environment, and look at the distribution of coefficients? Um, you know, in, in, and yeah. then compare it to you know what you would expect under the null, um, and, and test whether there's there's evidence for G by E at the SNP level. Individual SNP level. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I think it would be interesting. To, you know. If, you find evidence at the SNP level, but not at the PGS level, then that, you know, that would point to this, this 
linear aggregation as being the, the culprit for uh, the failure, the null result. Yeah. How big is your sample size, like combined, though? I mean, it's very hard to separate out noise from signal in, in the you know, 10,000 people that you have. Yeah, I think that's the order of uh, the size of the sample. Yeah, ten of the order of ten thousand for each of the three data sets. HRS may be a bit bigger. It's unfortunate that something can't be done. You, know, you don't have that type of. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I haven't really used the UKB. But you know, if you had <laughs> early life information about people on the UKB, and then you might have a hope of being identified to do something yeah. step by step. Yeah. Yeah. That's not really possible, So basically, the UKB, so far as we understand, it doesn't have any family SES measures. So this would, be, this would have been the ideal data set to do this in. No. Uh, because as an exercise, I, I see that it's nice to use one common SES measure and show that the results are believable and all that. But as a researcher, I would choose which environmental factors based probably upon something to do with theory, uh, some priors and then the particular polygenic score. And so... Well, our prior was, the theory was basically this notion of cumulative disadvantage, so it grows over time. This the very important role of the family environment, which, sure. which is but really educational. Prior, that, yeah, yeah. I, I might have different ones. And I guess yeah. I'm trying to understand, like, am I supposed to take this paper to mean you chose the wrong uh, uh, SES measure? You chose one that doesn't necessarily theoretically uh, 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 that wouldn't be expected to interact, or am I just cherry picking results because I don't do that? So I'm not sure what, you're, what, the, what you want to communicate with me, uh, because you know I've written papers where there are interactions, because and in part because I think my co and I chose specific, I guess, environmental factors to interact, and it wasn't this one, and so now I guess when you're like, oh, well, these guys might have gotten publication, I'm like, well, yeah, maybe they would have, but is that, is that bad, or? Uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, we, 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 we thought we were going to find it and didn't, and we also need to think still about what it all means. I mean, one thing is very simple, I think, which is that the way that this is done, it's a second order effect, kind of, right? I mean, the G is the first, the E is a first, and then the G by E is an interaction, so it's a kind of second order effect. Is, is that what we're seeing, or? or e, yeah, I, I mean, it raises a lot of questions. I don't think we have sorted them fully out. Um, in, in the paper on educational attainment, uh, you, you, there is also differences in the G by E found by the level of schooling, for example. So I think that may, we didn't find anything, but maybe that's completely washed out. So you could see that there is reasons to believe that there maybe is much more complexity in these kind of, uh, than, than what we're doing, this kind of brute force, right? We're applying everything in the same way. On the other hand, if we don't do that, then we becoming then it's becoming a fishing exercise a bit. We can just play around until we find it. So a bit, right? So that that's that's what we're trying to do here to stick to some simple rules. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here as someone who's read this work and decided every time that it's really neat but too hard for me to actually understand or actually do it myself. So it's exciting to be here and learn from all of you guys. Um, my education in this area has been limited to reading some of your papers and then we actually I actually had the pleasure of um, meeting Lauren and she presented at Penn this week. So I got a nice little tutorial in her presentation made me uh, that much better of a discussant. Um, so as you saw from uh, Titus's uh, presentation, this is an extremely ambitious paper and an extremely ambitious question. Uh, we all know uh, that you know the nature versus nurture debate. We've all had our own opinions whenever we've seen a child uh, misbehave in public Public. If it's your child, clearly that's all nature. If it's someone else's child, clearly that's all nurture and that parent needs to do better. Um, but this is actually a really interesting question of like, how do these actually interact? Um, not just nature versus nurture, does it matter? 
uh, but how can we actually, can these things actually influence each other? Um, 45 outcomes, three data sets plus a meta-analysis um, and two different formulations of the PGS. Um, and so definitely, uh, you know, large scale uh, uh, exercise to try to get at this question of, you know, can nurture, I look at it as more of can, can nurturing um, influence nature um, because we don't want to go down the, the, the road of trying to influencing nature. Um, so, so can nurture actually influence nature in and of itself? Um, and, you know, as Tudis mentioned, there's a lot of null results in here and it got me thinking of what else should we be thinking about when we look at these results? Um, other than that, you know, that the interaction terms were insignificant at the moment. Um, so what should we be thinking about the differences between the HRS and the um, Wisconsin study? Uh, there does seem to be some differences in terms of how much um, SES matters between the two, um, between the two samples. Um, and, you know, these are white Americans. Um, so is there something in there that, that we should be thinking about these samples are different? And there's something about the Wisconsin sample that is fundamentally different than saying that um, SES doesn't matter as much um, as it does in the nation. So maybe Wisconsin is actually a better place to be. There's more, uh, there's more opportunities for advancement and to sort of move beyond what is your sort of base SES uh, information. Um, I don't know if that's the right interpretation or not, but I think I think looking at these things and not just oh, there's different sample sizes, especially since these are these are pretty tight estimates. Um, you know, what is it that we should be learning about the underlying characteristics and so on what's going on? Um, similarly, the UK looks different than um, the US in, in some of these measures as well. Uh, here, uh, in particular, sort of like household income and education. Uh, SES has a different different role in the UK than it does in in the US. It seems like the the SES is much more inheritable or much more effective in education and household in the US. These are the two US samples. Um, and so, is it better to be British, right? And so, the, so just kind of like what is it that is telling us about society and the fact that these that these direct effects, even if the interaction effects are, are null, what are the direct effects telling us about the different societies that people are growing up in? I, th I thought it would be interesting as well to sort of explore that. Um, one question that came up, if I was like, you know, if I really wanted to be reviewer number two, when you send this to an econ uh, journal, you know, is there any evidence of gene selection under stress? I know that there's a relationship about um, gender of children and if the, if the woman is under stress, financial stress when she's pregnant, um, is there any evidence of gene selection from this bigger form, this bigger, these bigger measures, PGS, GWAS? I have no idea what the answer is. I think putting something in there might be important if you really want to uh, sort of nail that these genes are sort of random and it has nothing to do with the SES of the parent at the time. Um, and you guys talked about it a little bit already in the questions. Um, and I also had some questions about this occupation measure. You know, maybe education of the parents is actually more exogenous to all of this. That all was predetermined prior to having children most of the time. Um, occupation is kind of a mixed bag of what it is. It's kind of unclear. Uh, five levels of occupation. Um, and, you know, it is hypothetical that, you know, you could change your occupation when you wind up having 10 kids, maybe I need to make more money and I'm going to do, you know, do something else. And so there may be some relationships there. Um, uh, and I thought the, the occupation was the, the most endogenous of the SES measures that you used. Um, and I only know about variance PGS because of uh, Lauren's talk. Um, and so uh, talk to her uh, <laughs> as my suggestion that there may be something else there. Um, but I think this is really exciting. And, and the other thoughts I had just sort of on the bigger picture, you know, you know, like, like Tita said in his discussion um, at the end, you know, there's a lot that goes on between the time your parents' education and their occupation is decided and when they're measuring it. You know, maybe if we had an ideal situation, we could look at people in their 20s and see how much gene versus SES matters then, as opposed to waiting until they're older and 50 plus in the HRS, uh, because a lot of life has happened in between. Um, and I think that there's a, you know, if, if, I think there's also potential concern. These are all, you know, European uh, ancestry uh, people. Uh, maybe it does matter across different uh, types of individuals um, where, or, or, you know, different extremes of the income distribution uh, where these things really come into play. Um, you know, I think about like, the, you know, the moving to opportunities work where it does have impact on children. You know, if you change the environment in which they live, 
you know, maybe genes are actually what explains the variance and why some children who had that opportunity uh, succeeded and some did, didn't. And I think that um, thinking about genes as, a, me as a, um, a mechanism for which we explain heterogeneity, I think is really, really interesting um, and uh, worth further, further work by all of you that I will consume happily uh, when it comes out. That's all, very brief.